So gamma is just between one and two. And now, of course, this is just you know, functions that have a derivative, which is held of, of order gamma minus one. Uh, but one way of writing is, for example, I could say, well, okay, so it has a derivative which is held of order gamma minus one. But then what I could say is that this function, I actually consider it as a pair of functions. So I do as if the derivative were simply a second piece of data of which I don't know a priori that it actually happens to be the derivative of the first piece of data. Okay, so I consider my C gamma function, instead of considering it as one function, I consider it as two functions, f and f prime. Okay, and I don't assume a priori that f prime has anything to do with f. It's just two functions. So that the second one is, you know, held of order gamma minus one. And then what about the first one? Well, the natural thing here is to assume that, well, f of y minus f of x minus f prime of x times y minus x is of order y minus x to the gamma. And that in particular actually enforces f prime to be the derivative of f, right? Because, well, that's basically the der definition of derivative, or at least it implies. So now, instead of writing this as a pair f, f prime, I can just as well write it well, since any pair of function is the same as a function with values in R2, and then I can give any name uh, to the basis vectors of R2, and so I call my basis vectors of R2 purple 1 and purple x. Um, and so this suggests that, well, purple 1 is the coefficient, the thing in front of purple 1 is the coefficient of the constant part of the Taylor expansion at that point, and the coefficient in front of purple x is the coefficient in front of the linear part of the Taylor expansion, right? So, so functions in C2 are the same as functions of the form little f times purple 1 plus little f prime times purple x, where little f and little f prime satisfy this holder type bound, okay? So just a rewriting of the usual definitions. And now you notice that, you know, this R2 with basis vector purple 1, purple x. Also, you know, calling it purple 1 very much suggests that you would have a product for which purple 1 is the neutral element, right? So you can put a product here where purple 1 multiplied with anything is, doesn't change that thing. And purple x times purple x, I just impose it to be 0 because I don't have any other natural candidate here. Um, well, and now you see that magically, if you impose that rule and you write things like that, then the Leibniz rule actually just becomes normal multiplication also, right? So now if you have two functions, capital F and capital G, and I just multiply them pointwise, right? So now it's not just that I've rewritten C gamma in a slightly different way. I've written, written in a very, very natural way, you know, in which the product is again just the product, okay? Even though Right? A priori, it looked like sort of pairs of functions, so that it's not clear how we should multiply them. But if we write it in that way, it becomes absolutely clear how we should actually multiply them. And it automatically gives you the Leibniz rule, and it automatically satisfies that product of C gamma functions are C gamma again. Um, and you also note that these guys naturally come with a degree. Okay, so the degree of purple 1 is 0, and the p degree of purple x is 1. And why should the degree of purple 1 be 0 and the degree of purple x be 1? Um, it's really because, well, the purple 1, you know, if you look at the actual, so the coefficients in front are the coefficients of the Taylor expansion around that point. So that means that these guys actually encode the, you know, the Taylor monomials. Now, now purple 1 encodes the Taylor monomial 1. And the Taylor monomial 1 behaves around every point like distance to the point to the power 0. And that's why it should have degree 0. Okay, and purple x encodes the linear Taylor monomial, which of course behaves like distance to the point to the power 1. And that's why it should have degree 1. Now, so this is what I just said, right? So you have a natural also some kind of valuation map, if you want, which is for every point x, you have a linear map pi x, which takes as an input now the vector space spanned by purple 1 and purple x, and gives you the corresponding Taylor polynomial based at the point, at the point x. 
Okay, so pi x of purple 1 is just the constant function 1, and pi x of purple x is the linear function you know, z minus x. Okay, and so with this notation here, now if you have a C gamma function capital F, now if you want the Taylor expand the right, so if you want the Taylor polynomial of F at x, it's just pi x f of x. Right? So here pi x f of x is a function. It's the function z maps to uh, f of x plus f prime of x times z minus x, right? And you notice here that, well, first these pi x's, if you vary the base point of your Taylor monomials, then you can actually implement this by just, you know, reshuffling the coefficients of a Taylor polynomial, okay? So it, in other words, for any two points x and y, you have a linear map gamma x, y, that goes from the linear span of purple 1 and purple x into the linear span of purple 1 and purple x, and which has the property that pi y is pi x composed with gamma x, y. And the, here it's, it's very explicit, so it's just this map here. Okay, so if you just, you take this linear map, you take this definition of the pi axis, it's obvious that you have this identity here. Okay. And so now, with these notations, the, so remember, so here on the previous slide, so I had my definition of C gamma was these pairs of functions, you know, with this norm here. And so this didn't look very systematic, right? So somehow I had something that looked quite different for F prime than for F, okay? But actually, now with these notations, you have a very natural, nice way of writing this norm. So you can convince yourself that this here is exactly the same as what I wrote on the previous slide, right? Because what does this mean? So here, when I write, so here, this, these are elements in the linear span of purple one and purple x, and when I write sort of norm beta, it means that it's the coefficient in front of the term of degree beta, and so if beta equals zero, it's the coefficient in front of purple one, and beta equals one, it's the coefficient in front of purple x, okay? And so now first for, P, for beta equal 1, well, what you get, what you see is that you see, so the gamma xy, it never changes what's in front of x. It only changes what's in front of 1, okay? So for beta equal 1, the gamma xy, essentially, it's as if it didn't exist. And what you have here is just the little f prime of x minus little f prime of y divided by x minus y to the gamma minus 1. And that was exactly the first uh, bound, which is derivative is c gamma minus 1. And then for beta equals 0, um, well, there you note that this gamma xy, the definition here, is exactly such that it creates this additional term here. Okay, and so for, sorry, so for beta equals 0 here, you get exactly the second part of the definition of what it means to be C gamma. Okay. Um, so now here there's, well, no, there's absolutely nothing new here, right? It's sort of the old definition of C gamma going back to, I don't know how long. Um, but it's just, just rewritten in a neat way, and it's written in a neat way that somehow doesn't really make reference to much anymore, right? So, so here, now you can kind of start to see how you would want to generalize this, right? Because here now nothing tells, so of course, for example, it immediately generalizes to C gamma, not just between one and two, but between, you know, any integers, right? So all you have to do is you have to add a purple x square and purple x cube, et cetera. The product rules are still the usual product rules. The gamma is just the thing that basically turns x into x plus x minus y one and then it is, uh, you want it to basically be a morphism, so you want gamma of x squared to be gamma of x times gamma of x, etc. And so then that determines it uniquely, and that gives you the correct definition. Um, you know, and then you use exactly the same definition here, and you get C gamma for every, for every gamma. Um, but now, 
you could say, well, okay, so I could uh, introduce other symbols. Right? So I had only this purple one, purple X, and so on. Now I could start throwing new symbols in that mean different things and that have different product rules. Right? So nothing here forced these symbols to have anything to do with the polynomials. And nothing here forced the product rules to be the normal product rules. Nothing forced this gamma to be you know, something of the type polynomial of x minus y or anything like that. Right? So what you can do here is now you can say, well, okay, so instead of having linear span of purple one and purple x, you have any sort of graded vector space. So, of course, the thing you should have in mind here is linear span of purple 1, purple x, purple x squared, or things like that. Um, but now you could have things of arbitrary degree, and the degree doesn't need to be an integer, and it doesn't even need to be positive. Okay? So I allow for things of negative degree, and I allow for things of fractional degree. The only thing I want is that the degrees still somewhat behave like the degrees of polynomials in the sense that there is a lowest degree and you don't have accumulation points. So degrees are sort of discrete, so you can still do induction over the degree. Okay. Um, and then you want, well, so you want every guy in that vector space to represent some sort of you know, Taylor monomial and so as before, so you want these maps pi x that take, you know, purple x or purple 1 and spit out, you know, the actual function that they're supposed to represent in your Taylor expansion. Um, and so you have a linear map that takes an element of t and gives out, well, in general, it spits out a distribution okay, because you want things of negative degree. And so you want to replace, represent things like this white noise or stuff like that. Uh, and so you don't want to be restricted to just spitting out functions. You want to be able to spit out distributions here. Okay, so here the pi x is a family of linear maps from t into distributions, but you want them to behave near x in a way which is consistent with the notion of degree that we have here. Okay, in the sense that if you take a guy of degree alpha, Okay, so if you take a t tau of a certain degree, so if you take tau homogeneous, meaning that it's actually in one of the t alphas for a fixed alpha, and then I write this absolute value for the alpha in which it belongs to, okay, so it's degree, then you would want that if you take this distribution, and now you see, so earlier I mentioned, well, the reason why purple 1 is degree 0 is because the constant function behaves like y minus x to the power 0. So here these things are distributions. So you cannot just evaluate them at a point and say, well, the thing should be less than y minus x, y minus x to the power of the degree because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the best you can do for distributions is that you test it uh, against some localized test functions. So what you do is you take a test function like this, you localize it at scale lambda, uh, you scale it in such a way that, you know, it scales like a delta function, and then you test against this. Okay? And so if, you t if it's a monomial, which is homogeneous of degree whatever, k, and you test it against a function like this, you get exactly lambda to the k times some constant. And therefore, that's exactly what you want to impose. So that's, what you, that's how you sort of relate the sort of algebraic notion of degree here with some actual analytical bound. Um, and then what you want is you want these gamma xy's that transform, that allow you to sort of change the value of x. Okay? And so these, the only property that we're going to use is that they are, well, they're linear operators on T, so you want some group of linear operators on T, which has a similar property to the gammas here, which is that, you know, it doesn't actually, it's always gamma of something is always of the form that something plus stuff of lower order. Okay? That's exactly what you get when you change the base point of a monomial. Right? So if you have the monomial x to the k, you turn it into x minus h to the k, you expand that, well, you get x to the k plus stuff of lower order. Okay, and so you want uh, 
you want these gammas to have exactly the same form. So it's gamma of tau is always of the form tau plus some, something which belongs to the, you know, to the direct sum of the T alphas of degree less than alpha. I mean, the T betas of degree less than alpha. And, and then so you have this group of linear operators and you want you know, a collection gamma xy's which has exactly the property that we had before. And then again, we want it to be, you, we want these gamma xy's to have some analytical bound, which is compat compatible with our notion of degree. And what's the right uh, compatibility condition here? So I claim that it's this, so in the sense that if you take a guy of degree alpha, you hit it with this gamma xy, and you look at the components of degree beta, and beta has to be less than alpha because, well, because of the property of these gammas. Uh, then we want to have a bound which is of the order, the distance between the two points x and y to the power alpha minus beta, so to the power difference of degrees. Because that's exactly what you have when you expand a monomial, right? So if you take <coughs> x minus h cube, so you get x cube minus 3hx square, uh, etc. And then you see that the term in front of the coefficient of degree 2 is of order distance to the power 1, and this 1 is really 3 minus 2, okay, in the sense that the next term is going to be 3h square x, and this 2 here is really 3 minus 1, etc. <clears throat> okay, so now, so this is, so I'm going to call this a regularity structure. So regularity structure is just these two objects. So that's like the algebraic part of these objects. And then the analytical part, which is this collection of linear maps pi and the collection of operators gamma, that's what I call a model. Okay, so for all of these equations now, what's going to happen is that first you build one of these regularity structures. So this you build it out of the sort of formal form of the equation, okay? So you just look at what kind of operations appear in making sense of the right-hand side of the equation, and that's going to determine one of these algebraic structures. But then you're going to take, well, you're going to build random models from the noise, okay? So the algebraic part is going to be fixed, but the model, i.e. sort of these linear maps pi and the linear maps gamma xy's, these are going to be random themselves, so they are going to vary uh, depending on the realization of the noise. Okay. Right, so now, you see, so now we have this natural sort of generalization, and of course, you know, within this framework, this definition of C gamma still makes perfect sense, right? So these are now just functions with values in this vector space, and which satisfy exactly this bound here, except that here you take the supremum well over all the degrees less, the, less than gamma. Okay, so you only look at degrees less than gamma and you take this definition here. Um, and this still makes perfect sense. But now there's a very basic question. Right? So you have this notion of a kind of C gamma function or distribution. Now this capital F is a perfectly nice continuous function but now what does this function actually represent? Right, so, you, so before, remember what happened is that for every point x, we could look at the pi x f of x, and that was simply the Taylor polynomial based at x for f, so off order whatever the regularity of f is. Okay? So now this here still makes perfect sense. Okay, because we have this continuous function capital F that takes values in this vector space. Uh, and we have this collection of linear maps that for every element of this vector space gives you a distribution. And so now for every point x, we still have this pi x capital F of x, which is some distribution on whatever Rn we work on. Okay, so now for every point, we're given a distribution. And now the question is, well, you know, if this whole thing is going to be useful, then the first question you have to address is when is there actually one single distribution 
which does indeed, near every point, look like that distribution pi x f of x. So near the point x, it should look like the distribution pi x capital F of x. Right? Um, so that's the first theorem, which basically says that this always exists and is unique. Okay, so, so, you, so I define this space d gamma exactly like c gamma. Okay, and I just call it d gamma in order to remind myself that it's not the usual c gamma. Okay, but it's exactly the same definition as before. And now at every point x, we have this distribution pi x f of x. And the theorem is that for every, uh, well, okay, actually, so for every gamma in R, you always have this map which takes one of these capital F, and it takes as input more than, right, it takes as input the capital F, and it also takes as an input the pair pi and gamma, right, because it needs to know, well, it needs to be able to figure out what is pi x f of x, right. Uh, so it takes both of these guys as an input, and it spits out the distribution, and the distribution that it spits out, which I call rf, has the property that if you take any x, and you compare rf with pi x f of x, and then you you get a difference of two distributions, so you cannot evaluate it, but you can still test it against test function. You test again against one of these localized test functions. The thing that you get is of order lambda to the gamma. Uh, the gamma being, you know, that gamma up here. Um, and this is true. This is a non-trivial statement even if gamma is negative, right? Because the, you see, since you allow negative degree, the most negative degree could be even more negative than the gamma, so you could still have things of degree less than gamma, even if gamma is negative, right? Uh, so this definition is non-empty if you want, also if gamma is negative. And even if gamma is negative, that theorem is still true. But then it's just an existence theorem, whereas if gamma is positive, it's, uh, there's also a uniqueness statement. The uniqueness part is completely trivial. But it's, I mean, you sort of see from this definition that if there is one such RF, there can only be one. That's very easy to show. And the difficult part here is to show that it actually exists. Okay. Um, now, it might happen, and actually, so in, in the example that we're interested in, you know, what's going to happen is that you're going to first fix this small parameter epsilon. And then at fixed epsilon, you're going to try to describe your solution as an element in one of these d gamma spaces. And the whole point is that you want to have estimates that are uniform in epsilon, and that converge nicely as epsilon goes to zero. But now for fixed epsilon, even though some of our things have negative degree and so on, and we, in principle, allow them to be distribution, they will actually be continuous functions. Okay, so at fixed epsilon, our pi axis will actually be continuous functions. And if it so happens that they are continuous functions, then, well, it's actually quite easy to convince yourself that Rf of x has no choice. It has to be pi x f of x evaluated at x, if you can evaluate it. Okay, so, except that this definition here, of course, doesn't make sense in general, right? Because pi x f of x is in general a distribution, so you cannot evaluate it at x. Okay, but what the theorem says is that somehow if gamma is positive, in a way, it actually does make sense. Okay. So, now if you do this, um, it turns out that these d gamma spaces, you can actually recover many of the nice properties of, you know, the usual properties that you're sort of used to from Helder spaces. Or, you know, you could even model, I mean, so here I have a definition of d gamma. You could imagine sort of cooking up Sobolev type spaces and so on, right? Um, but so we stick to Helder spaces for the moment. So you have usual kind of results. So for example, now multiplication. So, so if you want to be able to multiply things, you have to give yourself a multiplication rule on T. Right? So in the definitions I gave so far, there was no, T was just a vector space. It didn't have any kind of algebraic structure on it. Um, so if you want to be able to multiply it, you have to give yourself a product. So say you have a product on T. And the natural, there's two conditions that you want for product. Um, the first one is that, you know, the degree of a product should be the sum of the degrees. That's a natural property of products. 
And the second one here um, is maybe a bit less obvious, should be that every element in this you know, group of operations G, which do this re-expansion around a different point, should have the property that if you apply it to a product, it's the same as applying it to the individual factors and then multiplying. And this is very natural if you think of polynomials, because it really just says, you know, you have a polynomial based at a point, and then you re-expand it around a different point, then that's the same. Uh, well, you have two polynomials based at a point. You multiply them. And then you re-expand around a different point. Well, it's, of course, the same as first re-expanding them around that point and then multiplying them. Right? It's obviously the same operation. And so this is something that you would want to impose, which is extremely natural, just because of what I just said. Um, and if you do that, then it turns out that, well, if you have one, if you have an F1 in this d gamma 1 and you have an F2 in d gamma 2 and you multiply them, then it's again in one of these d gamma spaces. And it's actually not in general in gamma equals sort of the min. Normally, for the usual Hilda functions, you end up picking the less regular of the two. Right? So here, in general, you actually pick up something even slightly less regular. So what you have to do is you have to look at What's the thing of lowest degree that appears in the description of each of these FIs? Okay. And then you look at gamma 1 plus the thing of lowest degree appearing in the description of F2, minimum gamma 2 plus the thing of lowest degree appearing in the description of F1. Okay, which is again sort of, you know, it's not surprising at all actually, because it just says that, you know, multiplying with something of negative degree is a little bit like taking some kind of fractional derivative. So you lose regularity in general. Okay? But you lose exactly the amount of regularity, which is sort of the lowest regularity appearing in the description of these guys. Um, and then the other thing you want is a Schauder estimate. Okay? So because you want to take your equation and rewrite it as a fixed point problem. So you want to write it as an integral equation. Um, and then it means that you want some kind of regularity estimate for convolution with the heat kernel. And you have exactly that. So, so it turns out that, but for this, there are, you have to somehow make more assumptions. So you have to build. The thing is that you need then for every, if you want for el every element in your vector space T, you need some kind of linear map, which I call curly I, which somehow represents the convolution of that element with the heat kernel in some sense. Um, and then it turns out that you can actually build, so if you have this, so you need certain algebraic structure on the space T, and then you actually need also certain compatibility condition on this model, the, so the pi x's and the gamma xy's. Okay, so there's essentially a formula that tells you how the pi x should act on these elements here, given that you know how it acts on the tau itself. But assuming that you have that, um, then the theorem is that you can actually build a linear operator that improves regularity by 2. So it maps d gamma into d gamma plus 2, and which has the property that it it really represents convolution with the heat kernel in the sense that if you take a guy in d gamma, you act with this operator, and then you apply this reconstruction operator, so you look at the actual distribution that it represents, or function, maybe. Then that's exactly the same as first looking at which distribution it represents, and then just convolving that with the heat kernel. Okay. So you have this identity here. And furthermore, that operator is actually of the form simply applying that linear map pointwise plus other stuff. And the other stuff is complicated, but the only thing one needs to know uh, for the purpose of this lecture is that the other stuff is going to only involve elements that are proportional to, say, the usual Taylor monomials. Okay, so in this part, you actually need to have the usual Taylor monomials floating around. So you need to have the purple 1, purple x, purple x squared, et cetera, if you want. Yeah. Um, right. So you have these. So let's assume that we have these two ingredients. OK, so we know how to multiply things. And the amount of regularity you lose by multiplying is essentially the degree of the thing of lowest degree that appears in your description. 
and you have some shadow estimate that allows you to gain two degrees of regularity. Okay, so now, so here is what you want to do now. Okay, so for that five four equation. Say. So first, you want to build one of these regularity structure which is sufficiently rich um, that it allows you to somehow encode all the operations that you need to turn that into to a fixed point problem. Right? So, so using variation of constants formula, um, you would want to rewrite this. Right? So this equation, you would want to, so the equation, remember, is dt phi equal Laplace and phi, and then say minus phi cube plus the noise. And I would want to write it as phi is equal to the heat kernel convolved. So this is space-time convolution with sort of indicator function for positive times times this right-hand side, minus phi cubed plus xi, plus just the heat kernel applied to the initial condition. OK, so this is variation of constants formula. And so you see, in order to make sense of this equation, this guy, even if the initial condition is very irregular, the heat kernel is smoothing. So this is immediately a smooth function. So if I have the usual Taylor monomials, I can describe this guy to arbitrary order. Right? This becomes a C infinity function immediately. Um, and then I need to somehow be able to describe this. And so you see, I need exactly the two operations that I just mentioned. I need to be able to multiply phi with itself twice. And I need to be able to convolve with the heat kernel. Okay? And here, well, I need to be able to multiply by indicator function with positive times. But this, uh, well, I just multiply with indicator function with positive times. And so you want to build a structure which has sort of enough structure so that it, these two operations, multiplication and convolution with the heat kernel, make sense. And then you want to rewrite, reformulate the equation as a fixed point problem in one of these d gamma spaces. Okay. Um, and then you want to show that, well, that fixed point problem has nice local solutions, so you have usual kind of PDE theory for it. And, and furthermore, that solution would depend continuously, not just on the initial condition, but actually also on the choice of this model pi and gamma. Okay, because now, you know, all these constructions depend on the choice of pi and gamma. And so it depends on the model, but you want that the solution is continuous as a function of the model. And furthermore, uh, you would want, now for every smooth noise, you want to be able to build a model in a kind of canonical way, so that if you feed this into this fixed point problem in d gamma and then apply this reconstruction operator to the solution, well, you simply get you know, the solution to the original equation. Um, and then you would want to tweak the definition of how you built this model from the noise in such a way that you actually make it converge to a limit. So remember, that was this randomization group acting uh, on this space of models. And then you want to identify what did this actually do to my equation in order to see which sequence of equations do you have to look at in order to actually get a non-trivial limit. Okay, so that's the plan uh, for the next five minutes. Um, <coughs> so so one, one crucial remark here is that even though at fixed, so at fixed epsilon, in principle, all these objects are nice and smooth. So the usual product makes perfect sense, right? But nothing here forces anything like reconstruction of a product being the product of the reconstructions, okay? So that's the crucial thing here, right? Is that you have a product up there it needs to have certain natural properties and so on, but these properties don't actually determine it uniquely. Okay? And so even when everything is smooth, it's not necessarily the case that you know, if you have two guys f and g, each of them actually represents a smooth function, but you multiply them up there and then you apply this reconstruction to it, 
there's no reason why this should be the same as actually multiplying as the usual product of functions. Okay, that's not enforced here. And that's, that's the whole point somehow. Right, because that's how you could have suddenly additional terms popping out of nowhere in your equation. Okay, so now here is, well, so you rewrite the equation. Well, so this is what I just did on the blackboard, right? So the equation in integral form is that. And now assuming that everything makes sense, I rewrite it as a fixed point problem in this d gamma space using this operator curly k, which came with that child I estimate. Okay, so that's the one which is supposed to represent convolution with the heat kernel. And so what I've done here, you see I've just introduced a new symbol, purple xi, which represents the noise. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to postulate that purple xi has degree minus five halves minus kappa, because this is exactly the regularity of white noise. Okay, so if you take white noise, you hit it with a you know, approximate delta function like this, you look at the expectation of the square of the thing you get, you get exactly epsilon to the minus five, or lambda to the minus five, but that was the expectation of the square, and so the thing itself has order epsilon to the minus five half. Okay, so the degree here should naturally be minus five half in dimension three. Um, and then, so capital Xi should represent the noise. So what it means is that I would want so this pi X applied to capital Xi to be simply Xi, or say Xi epsilon. Okay, in particular, this doesn't depend on X. Okay, so this is a function of, this is itself a function or distribution, right? So this depends on Y, and then this is the noise at Y but it doesn't depend on that point x. And so that means that I would want the gamma to act trivially on it. Okay? And so now, okay, so I can do that, but now you see, you note that if I do this, then somehow what I mentioned a couple slides earlier would force me to introduce lots of new symbols, because if I have that symbol psi appearing here, then this guy involved some map i of whatever, that means that I will also need that symbol. I need to have something which is the result of I applied to Xi, and so what I do, I simply introduce a new symbol which I call I of Xi. Okay. Uh, and so I need a symbol I of Xi, but now if you have an I of Xi appearing in the description of Phi, that means that now here I will have an you know, I of Xi cube, and maybe also I of Xi itself, because in the description of Phi I will have the purple one, which should not change anything, and you, I will also need an I of size square, etc. Right, so you start to have lots of new symbols popping up, and all of them have natural degrees, because you know that the degree of a product is sum of the degrees, and the degree of I of something, it's supposed to be the degree of that something plus two. So I is supposed to always increase degree by two. Okay, but suppose that you have all of these symbols, and that you can set things up in such a way that all the operations make sense, then now, now you can hope to actually make sense of this as a fixed point argument in some d gamma, because you see, suppose that phi is in some d gamma, then where should phi cube be? Well, hopefully the degrees are going to sort of increase. That means that the thing of lowest degree here should actually be the xi. Right? The most irregular part here should be the xi itself in the right hand side, which is degree minus five half. That means that the lowest thing in the description of phi should have degree minus a half, right? Because it should be the i of psi, which has degree two beta and minus five half plus two is minus a half. And so when you take phi cube, it means you take phi and you multiply it with phi twice. And so every time you lose degree a half, and so you would essentially expect that phi cube is in d gamma minus one, and maybe you lose another fudge factor because there's a minus kappa here. Okay, and so that would tell you that at least if you start off with gamma high enough, then this is still in some d gamma with positive regularity. So it still represents a unique distribution. Okay. And then you have the Schaller estimate, which says that when you hit this with this k, well, you gain two, and so you end up in d gamma plus one, minus two kappa. And so you have a fixed point problem where you gain 
actually even gain a whole degree of regularity every time. Right? And so therefore, you know, you play your usual tricks of sort of turning gains of regularity into making the thing small in a suitable norm, and you can show that the fixed point problem has a unique solution. Okay. And so you can do exactly that. Um, and so now how do you lift the model? So now you have you had to introduce this whole collection of new symbols. And so you have to somehow produce rules that tell you now given a realization, a smooth realization of the noise, so of one of these xi epsilon, you know, how do you build the pi x and the gamma xy's? So now there's a very natural way of doing it. You say, well, so for xi, I already told you what to do. You just say, well, it's equal to the xi itself. And then the natural thing is to just say pi x of a product is the product of the pi x's. Okay, so that's somehow the canonical thing that you would want to do, but you don't have to do that, but that's the canonical thing to do. Uh, and then for the i of anything, there's some kind of complicated formula, and there are good reasons why this is the right formula, but I don't want to go into details of that. Um, but the point here is that every symbol that's going to appear is going to be built from the purple xi and from purple 1, purple x, purple x squared, etc., by only these two operations, either multiplying things or hitting it with this curly i. Because that's basically the two operations out of which I build my fixed point map. Okay, and so this completely specifies how, given any smooth xi, you lift it to this structure. Okay? Um, and then it's easy to check that you know, if you take solution to that fixed point problem, um, and then you take this canonical lift of any smooth function, and then you look at the, you know, you hit that guy with this reconstruction map, then it actually solves the equation which is formally somehow identical to that equation. And that just comes from, you know, this guy always represents convolution with the heat kernel, whatever. And phi cube doesn't necessarily, right? So I, told you that reconstruction applied to a cube is not necessarily the cube of the reconstruction applied to phi, but it is if the pi was built in the canonical way. Okay, so then it's easy to check. So if the pi axis satisfy that pi x of a product is the product of the pi axis, you know, then it's you know, kind of plausible that this will also, well, it's essentially trivial because the calculation is here, right? I mean, it's a, it's a one-line calculation to you just check, okay? Um, and now the point is what's going to happen is that if you do that and you try to send epsilon to zero, things are not going to converge, okay? And so you see that already very easily if you take the simplest, one of the simplest sort of non-trivial symbol, which would be this i of xi square, then this is supposed to represent sort of heat kernel convolved with the psi epsilon squared, and then you just compute the expectation of that, and you get something of order one of epsilon. Okay, so it's clearly it's not going to converge to any limit as epsilon goes to zero. But it turns out that, well, the only way it diverges is actually because its expectation gets big. So all you have to do is actually subtract its expectation, and then what's left converges to a limit. Okay, so it it's not always as lucky as that, but I mean, in this particular case for the square here, all you have to do is subtract the expectation and then the rest actually does converge to a limit. Um, and so now the thing you have to do is, well, you have to look at all the non-trivial symbols that kind of appear and you have to check, you have to see, well, so what are the tweaks that I'm allowed to do which make sure that these guys converge to a limit but then it becomes sort of non-trivial, right? Because the, well, it's not clear a priori what are you allowed to do and what are you not allowed to do, right? Because the whole thing had quite a lot of rigidity, right? So there were lots of analytical bounds that these pi's and the gamma xy's had to satisfy. And there were also some algebraic identities that had to be satisfied. Uh, and now if you start to tweak, mess around with the, the way, so everything is designed in such a way that if you take this canonical lift, then automatically everything is nicely satisfied, except that the analytical bounds might break. But now if you start tweaking, messing around with the definitions of your products and things, 
you might start breaking things all over the place. Okay, so there's no guarantee a priori that the whole thing stays consistent. Um, and so there you can actually basically uh, characterize, or, well, we don't have a good complete characterization yet, but there's an indirect, there's a sort of implicit characterization of the operations that you're allowed to do that don't break the consistency of the whole scheme. Okay? And this turns out to be one of these operations. Okay? And that's, that's this renormalization group. Okay? So this group of transformation this, it essentially parametrizes the tweaks that you're allowed to make which don't break the whole structure. Okay. Um, and so here is what you do in this particular example. So I think, okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, so maybe I should sort of skip that, but may I just show you in a very, very quickly. So you introduce this graphical shorthand notation because, you know, expressions start to get very big very quickly, and so instead of having things like this, so you essentially replace them by the syntactic tree. Um, and so now your basis elements in that space T are basically sort of little, you know, little trees like that. Um, and then it turns out that the kind of operations that are allowed are recursive substitution of trees of negative homogeneities by constants. And so these two are actually the two <coughs> sort of trees of negative homogeneity that need renormalization. Okay, and so, the, so you have a linear map from T to T, which essentially consists in taking your symbol, look at all the occurrences of these two subsymbols, and then substituting them by these constants here. Okay, so for example, uh, applied to thi so this symbol here contains this guy either sort of three times as a subsymbol up here, and so it gives you, so if you substitute it by a constant, you get this. You have it as a subsymbol down here, which gives you this. You could also make a double substitution that gives you this. Or you have this guy, which appears also three times as a subsymbol. Okay? So you have these type of substitution rules, and there's a, there's a general theorem that tells you that these kind of rules are actually allowed, provided that this the sub-symbol that you substitute by a constant has negative homogeneity. And then the structure of the equation guarantees that there are only finitely many such sub-symbols with negative homogeneity, and that's what tells you that there are only finitely many constants you need to tweak. Okay? Um, and then it turns out that now, then it's a theorem that if you do these kind of substitution and then you build a model which has this property. So essentially it means that what you do is you first do the canonical lift and then you act on things with this linear map. It's actually not quite that. You have to do something slightly different, uh, but for practical purposes you, think, you can think of it that way. Um, and then it turns out you can choose these two constants in the right way so that what you get converges to a limit. And you can completely characterize the limit. So you can just check that it doesn't depend anymore on the regularization that you started from, okay? Because you have a completely explicit characterization of the limiting objects. Um, and then you can go back to the equation and sort of see what's the effect on the solution, okay? And so, so I want to just finish with that. So you see, what you see is the following. So if you look at any solution to this fixed point problem, so you have your fixed point problem, so it's of the, this form here, right? That's what I mentioned early on, which is that, that that operator is really just acting with I plus stuff which gives you something proportional to the Taylor monomials. And then you, re just by repeatedly substituting this into itself, you can find that any solution to this will always be of this form, okay, for some functions phi and gradient phi. Uh, but gradient phi is not necessarily the actual gradient of phi, right? So it's like the FF prime for the Hölder functions where you know, F prime is not necessarily the actual derivative of F, except that then it gets enforced uh, by the norms. Here it doesn't, at least for fixed epsilon, it doesn't get enforced by the norms. Okay, so there's no relation between phi and gradient phi that's enforced by the norms, at least for fixed epsilon. 
uh, but any solution will always be of that form. Uh, and then the whole point of the fixed point problem is to actually determine these functions phi and gradient phi, but then you know, it sort of does that for you. And now what you can do is, you, well, you look at the phi cube. So if phi is of this form here, you just cube this whole thing. You get something like this, some kind of complicated expression. And now, well, you know that it's going to be of that form. And then you just see what do you get when you apply the reconstruction operator to this. And then you can just look at the form of this linear map M, and it basically tells you how the reconstruction operator applied to that guy relates to uh, the reconstruction operator applied to, you know, just one of these little, just the I of Xi itself, and cubed. Right? And you can do similar things for each term in here. And so then it tells you at the end of the day how applying the reconstruction operator to this complicated expression relates to applying it to phi itself. And you get this answer here, which is that when you apply it to phi cube, it's the same, same as applying it to phi and then cubing it, and then subtracting something which is linear, proportional to the reconstruction operator applied to phi, and with some proportionality constant in front, which is some linear combination of these two randomization constants. Okay? And so then that's the thing that tells you, well, the equation that you actually have to look at if you want to get a limit, well, it has to be the one where instead of having a phi cube in the right-hand side, you have this right-hand side here, and these two constants have to be exactly the two constants that make these guys converge. Okay? Um, and... Okay, I think I'm going to stop here because I'm ran I'm over time already. Okay, sorry for that. Ah, no, because here actually, so the phi cube here, um, it makes perfect sense as a space-time distribution. But it doesn't make sense for fixed time, it doesn't make sense as a distribution in space. Okay? Um, but actually here it makes sense as a space-time distribution, it actually makes sense. So there's... Uh, so the, uh, the renormalization that you need to do for the phi cube is simply the one, well, so the C1 is what you would call the wick renormalization, and then this is this mass renormalization, right? So the C2 is this additional log. So you have to just, you do exactly this renormalization here, but then that gives you a space-time distribution which you would interpret as phi cube, okay? It's just that it doesn't make sense as a distribution in space for fixed time, right? So then you would, so in the static problem, you wouldn't be able to see this because, right? So, you, so there you just try to build a distribution in space and there phi cube doesn't exist somehow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but here you don't, here there's no additional randomization. Thank you.